21st century will belong to vegetarian. This is cause of death in the world. Whether or not, if I prove that an apple is better than a mango, that doesn't mean mango is prohibited. I have some problems with this. Man has become an animal. He's more like a lawyer than like a scientist. Foreign is incomplete. There's a misconception. Neither a single verse which is against established. And I challenge Dr. William Campbell. It's a different situation. I will not tempt God. I'd apologize if I've hurt the feelings of any Christians. It was just a reply to Dr. William Campbell's book. Your brother has asked a very complicated question. The answer is very clear. Major minor religion, fraud is prohibited. Ask me a direct question. I'll be too willing to give you a reply. Is milk better or non-veg? If this was not done, life on the earth would have ceased to exist. Then could you please prove it authentically? The word Trinity doesn't exist. It's a CDC baat hai. Smoking is prohibited. That's final. I hope I have answered properly. It's illogical and unfair. That does not mean Quran is wrong. It has really moved me. Is there a father in this world who would not try to provide for his children and his wife? Is there a father in this world who would want to be locked up in a cell away from his family? Is there a father in this world who would not defend justice and rights? Ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and welcome to a meeting entitled Shared Values. This is organized by Brent Islamic Circle in association with Forum for Social Studies from Saudi Arabia. This is the first time that we've actually done an interactive meeting with Christian speakers. For those of you who think that this is going to be a debate and a slanging match, you could actually leave now because that's not the intention of the evening. The evening's intention is to try and understand each other's viewpoints a lot further and to see what we have in common. Basically, the outline of the evening will be that shortly there will be a chronic recitation and a recitation from the Bible. Then we have Dr. Reverend William Taylor talking on community values and the role of religion in the next century. Then we have Dr. Naik from India speaking about family values. Then a further five minutes for Dr. William Taylor to comment on any of the earlier speakers. Between 10 and 11, there'll be an hour reserved for question and answers, and they will be purely written questions. There is paper on every seat. If anybody wants to ask a question, please just handwrite it and put it on one of the tables on the side, and we'll try and answer as many as possible. I'd like now to uh, ask uh, Brother Tayeb Sharif, who is an A-level student hoping to go to university this year, to do a chronic recitation. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فما أوتيتم من شيء فمتاع الحياة الدنيا وما عند الله خير وأبقى للذين آمنوا وعلى ربهم يتوكلون وما عند الله خير وأبقى وما عند الله خير وأبقى للذين آمنوا وما عند الله خير وأبقى للذين آمنوا وعلى ربهم يتوكلون والذين يجتنبون كبائر الإثم والفواحش وإذا ما غدبوهم يغفرون والذين استجابوا لربهم وأقاموا الصلاة وأمرهم شورا بينهم ومما 
These are verses 36 to 42 of Surah number 42, Surah Shura. In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the giver of mercy. Whatever you are given here is but the enjoyment of this life. But that which is with Allah is better and more lasting. It is for those who believe and put their trust in their Lord. Those who avoid the greater sins and indecencies and when they are angry, even then forgive. Those who respond to their Lord and establish regular prayer, who conduct their affairs by mutual consultation, who spend out of what we bestow on them for sustenance. And those who when an oppressive wrong is inflicted on them are not cowed but help and defend themselves. The recompense for an injury is an injury equal thereto in degree. But if a person forgives and makes reconciliation, his reward is due from Allah. For Allah loveth not those who do wrong. But indeed, if any do help and defend himself, even after a wrong done to him, against such there is no cause of blame. The blame is only against those who oppress men with wrongdoing and insolently transgress beyond bounds through the land, defying right and justice. For such, there will be a chastisement grievous. But indeed, if any show patience and forgive, that would truly be an affair of great resolution. Sadaqallahul Azim. 
Thank you very much, Dave. I'd now like to ask uh, Brother Brian Gates, who is a local councillor in the Borough of Harrow, to do a short reading from the Bible. I'm reading two passages this evening, one from the Old Testament and uh, one from the New. And the Old Testament reading is in the book of Psalms, and it's Psalm 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. And the second reading from the Bible this evening is taken from the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament. And it's chapter 25, verses 34 to 46. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, O blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see thee hungry and feed thee, or thirsty, and give thee drink? And when did we see thee a stranger, and welcome thee, or naked, and clothe thee? And when did we see thee sick, or in prison, and visit thee? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when did we see thee hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to thee? Then he will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Now I'd like to welcome Reverend Dr. William Taylor, who is an Anglican priest and area dean of Ealing in West London. His academic background is in Middle Eastern languages, politics, and theology. He worked on his PhD thesis on non-Muslim minorities in the Ottoman Empire while training for the priesthood at Cambridge. Formerly on the Archbishop of Canterbury's personal staff at Lambeth Palace, his responsibilities were for relations with Orthodox churches, especially in the Near East. He was a chaplain to the British Embassy in Amman, Jordan, while acting as a consultant for Orthodox relations to the Diocese of Jerusalem. He has traveled extensively in most of the Turkic-speaking republics in Turkey and every Arab country except Mauritania. He is a writer and broadcaster, and as he's, as he's given me such a long introduction, maybe I could ask him to cut his speech down by a couple of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very grateful for this opportunity to be with you this evening and to listen to views and to share my own based on my own experience of working with Islam in the Middle East and in this country. My subject is one which I believe is especially important at the moment to all societies and particularly to those who are in a position to affect change within society. That's to say those in political authority, the religious leadership, academic institutions, and those in public service, business, diplomats, as well as decent men and women of all walks of life. The question is this. What should be the role of religious faith 
in defining a community's values, direction, and even public policy. We can be sure of one thing. This question is not going to go away, even in the liberal secular West. Last year, the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington published a book entitled Religion, the Missing Dimension of Statecraft. The whole thesis of this book is that public policymakers, especially in the West, have consistently underestimated the potency of religious faith in forming public policy. In Western policymaking, who could have predicted, for example, the explosion of so-called ethnic and religious fervor which marked the collapse of the former Yugoslavia. In any case, such foresight would, I believe, have demanded more historical education than our political classes have been known for. Similarly, the religious leadership must play a more dynamic and creative role in conflict resolution. Now, in much of the world, we have underestimated for too long the ability of religions, of cultures and religions to create divisions. We have failed to grasp what that can mean, particularly for young people. Even more than ethnicity, religion discriminates sharply between people. For example, a person can be half French and half Arab and simultaneously a citizen of two countries. It is more difficult to be half Catholic and half Muslim. One of the best known Christian theologians, the German Roman Catholic theologian Hans Kung, gave a lecture in London last year entitled Towards a Global Ethic. His thesis, and mine today, is that the search for peace between the world faiths is one of the most urgent tasks facing humankind. He said this, Hans Kung, Without peace between the religions, war between the civilizations. No peace among the religions without dialogue between the religions. No dialogue between the religions without investigation of the foundations of the religions. I believe that analysis to be correct, and I want to give four pointers this evening, and I will be brief, which might be helpful to people of faith, in particular to Muslims and Christians. I do not believe that this is a specialist activity for academics and religious leaders, but needs to inform all aspects of private practice and public policy, especially in religiously plural societies such as our own. The four principles I want to suggest are these, and these are the four principles which the Archbishop of Canterbury used when he met the religious leadership in Al-Azhar in Egypt. And this is speaking especially in Christian relations with Islam. Firstly, friendship, not hostility. Secondly, understanding, not ignorance. Thirdly, reciprocity, not exclusivism. And fourthly, cooperation, not confrontation. And I'll briefly elaborate these headings. So firstly, friendship, not hostility. I choose to use the word friendship rather than the word tolerance. Tolerance, I believe, is often linguistically misused to mean an indifference towards those things we don't particularly care about. For example, I tolerate your smoking, but it really gets up my nose. True friendship is the uh, context where differences can be held harmoniously and where mutually exclusive beliefs can be held without antagonism or hatred. Dr. Albert Hurani, a world-class scholar of the Arab and Muslim world, wrote this. Nobody can write with meaning about the world of Islam if he does not bring into it some sense of a living relationship with those of whom he writes. Now, Hurani's description of a living relationship is vital in any dialogue, either between individuals or between institutional religions on a more formal level. This is not just an exchange of ideas. 
but he's also much more simple in these terms, in exchange of hospitality and human kindness. In any case, the practice of hospitality is central to all the major world faiths, it certainly is to Islam, and has shaped many cultures, not least the kaleidoscope of cultures, which is modern multi-faith Britain. That's the first principle. Second one, understanding, not ignorance. I continue to find it extraordinary how ignorant people of faith are of each other, be they Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, Jew, Jain, or Christian. Yet ignorance is the most terrible of cultural diseases, for from it stem fear, misunderstanding, and intolerance. To take one example, Islam has been consistently misunderstood, misrepresented in the West, and it continues to be. Dr. Aziz Al-Ami, professor of Islamic studies in the University of Exeter, has shown how the Western caricature of Islam has typically gone through three phases. Prior to the 16th century reformation, it was caricatured as intolerant and evil. During the 18th century, enlightenment as strange and ridiculous, and in modern times, as a faith to be feared. Professor John Esposito from Georgetown University, Washington, elaborated this in a paper given in Amman, Jordan, and I'm going to quote from it. He said this, we live in a world in which it remains common to speak of or see headlines with these terms, militant Islam, resurgent Islam, fundamentalist Islam, Islamic bombs, Islamic extremism, Islamic fanatics, Islamic guerrillas, and Islamic terrorism. Even the former Secretary General of NATO caused a stir when he spoke of Islam as the new communism, a remark which brought criticism and a hasty retraction. This is a cartoon comic world view, and in it, Islam is perceived as a threat to Western civilization. But it is not news to point out the more accurate picture, the historic debt of Western scholarship to Islamic thought and, and practice, nor of the contemporary manifestations of outstanding cooperation. Jordan and Syria both now have formal institutes for the advancement of dialogue between Islam and Christianity. The Jordanian one is a particularly exciting example of an institute funded and promoted by royal patronage and which is set now to expand its base for dialogue to include Judaism, a tripartite dialogue of the three Abrahamic faiths, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. Or it isn't news to speak of the many excellent centers for religious dialogue in South Asian culture in India, many of which I have visited, and which are too numerous to list nor to speak of the years of patient and often difficult work, for example in Britain, which went into the shaping of a new agreed syllabus for religious education in British schools. This excellent syllabus draws on all the major faiths in producing a syllabus to educate British children which should do away with much of the past ignorance. This is a relatively new situation for people in Britain. Only within the past 30 to 40 years has Britain become a multicultural and multi-religious society. Take just one small concrete example in myself. In my school education, teaching about any other faith than Christianity simply did not exist. My six-year-old godson, however, spent an evening recently explaining the difference between Diwali and Guy Fawkes Night. This can only be positive in creating a culture of understanding and not ignorance. Then thirdly, reciprocity and not exclusivism. If we seriously want peace and harmony on our overcrowded planet, then friendship and respect we must have towards people of other faiths in a mutual way. 
This, of course, is more difficult for some religions than for others. I'm going to take two specific examples now, Islam and Christianity. Islam and Christianity are both missionary faiths. They make absolute claims and are anxious to promote their faiths. Muslims are commanded in the Holy Quran to act as witnesses for mankind, just as Christians are commanded in Holy Scripture to go into the world and preach the gospel. So the question to be put to both Muslims and Christians is this. Can believers who really believe passionately in their hearts that theirs is a missionary faith really be committed to dialogue? My own answer to this is that they must be and that they have a distinguished his history of doing so in the past as in the present. Take yourself as an individual as an example whatever religious position. Now ask yourself this question. Would you say of yourself that because you have a clearly and lovingly held identity within a particular religious faith, that your willingness to listen, to learn, and to grow is diminished by that? In any case, no religious faith encourages its members to commend their faith arrogantly, irresponsibly, or deceitfully. Now move on from this, and this is a question addressed to any who are in a majority religion. Is a majority faith willing to offer the same rights and privileges that it expects for its own members? This is a particularly urgent issue, whether it addresses minority Muslim groups in the West or whether it addresses minority Christian groups in the Muslim world. In Britain, there is a particular urgency as we address the question of Muslim schools as independent institutions financed partly by the state. In my own area of London, Ealing, moves to create a Muslim school were eventually blocked by the local authority on the grounds that it would create inter-religious conflict, the majority community in that part of London being Sikh, and which community had led a vocal campaign against it. My own view on this is to emphasize the positive contribution which South Asian culture has made and is making to British life. I believe the solid commitment to religious faith from this community has helped to raise the profile of all religious faiths in Britain. British culture had come to think of religion as unimportant, a society which had begun to assume that everything has its price and can be measured and assessed in quantitative terms, has had to see some things, religious faith, as priceless. And this is certainly the view of the leadership of, of the mainstream churches in Britain. The Archbishop of Canterbury, in a recent address to the Muslim ulema at Al-Azhar University in Cairo, spoke of his role in guaranteeing religious freedom for all citizens. In prisons and hospitals, Christian chaplains help to ensure that the religious needs of those of other faiths are met. The Church of England has helped to finance a major academic and policy-making study on the role of the faith communities within Britain. I would want to ask, perhaps a bit provocatively, in how many other countries would the uh, established religion be prominent in securing the religious rights of those who are not of their faith? So to move on and to conclude. Finally, cooperation, not confrontation. In spite of all the complexities, there are many areas in the way we organize ourselves as societies where the religious traditions can and do develop wide areas of cooperation. The religious faiths, Christianity and Islam, can and do provide a strong basis for joint commitment to humanity's struggle to overcome evil, disease, and poverty. Let me point to just a few of these areas of cooperation. 
and the context I want to set this in is society. Devout followers of all faiths are encouraged to be responsible citizens and good neighbors. This in turn not only involves a certain lifestyle in community, but a private lifestyle which takes seriously a commitment to respect and to love others. In the contemporary Indian context, of course, this was superbly and incomparably demonstrated by Mahatma Gandhi. The commitment to moral values, the importance of the family, respect for a non-violent way of settling disputes, care for the poor and the underprivileged, and a sense of obligation and accountability to the one who judges all human life. Common religious faith would say that justice and integrity should be at the heart of society. Laws of society require a moral foundation. Experience shows that human beings cannot be improved by the imposition of law alone. This understanding affects our concepts of justice. It affects those who administer the law. It weighs in the balance those who rule. Justice must mean justice for all. So to conclude, we look for cooperation in working for peace based on tolerance and understanding. And this, of course, ties closely with work for peace in general, but is also much broader. Wherever we look in the world, xenophobia is an enemy to racial and religious harmony. Religion, when it is hijacked by extremists, will always do this. Work for tolerance is not accidental, but it needs to be sustained and vigorous. Violence is always violence, whatever the justification. Murder is always murder, especially when it is done in the name of God. So, to sum up, my argument is that religious faith is vital to the well-being and harmony of society, and it will continue to be so. And the Muslim community in Britain has a vital role in this, in challenging our secular society. There is no society which has survived without it. That's religious faith. The collapse of all formerly atheist states has proved this beyond doubt. Religious faith is not about to go away, now nor in the future. So policymakers need to be aware of this. Religious faith, if properly interpreted, is an enormous positive force for good in just some of the areas I've outlined. And I remain utterly convinced that the role of religions, Christianity and Islam in particular, within our own society, is a vital ingredient in the search for peace, order, and harmony in our own society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Taylor, for sticking well to time and keeping the meeting running on time. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Zakir Naik. He is president of the Islamic Research Foundation. He's a medical doctor by profession, but has dedicated a lot of his life to spreading the, the truth of Islam worldwide, especially amongst millions of English-speaking audiences. Uh, he has more than 100 lectures and debates and symposia available on audio and video cassettes, uh, which are extremely popular. I've actually got a whole page, which I won't read out, and I think when you hear him, uh, his qualities will be obvious to you. I'd like to ask him to come and speak on family values and to try and stick to the topic of family values for the next 20, 25 minutes, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalam. Ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. Auz billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Hunna libasul lakum. Wantum libasul lahunna. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Rabbi shuhali sadri. Respected Reverend, Dr. Jamal Badwi, my respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, blessings, and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. The topic allotted to me for this Christian Muslim dialogue is family values in Islam. Family values in Islam should not be judged 
by what individual Muslims do or what the Muslim society does. It should be judged according to the authentic sources. That's the glory of Quran and the Sahih Hadith. I have divided the family values into three broad headings, as those related to the children, that the sons and the daughters, as those related to the spouses, that is the husband and wife, and those related to the parents, that is father and mother. Let's first discuss the family values related to the children, that's the daughter and the son. The glorious Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number six, verse number 151, as well as Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 31, that kill not your children for want of sustenance. For it is Allah who will give sustenance to you and your children. For killing of children is a major crime. Killing of infants, whether male or female, is prohibited in the glorious Quran. And a special reference is made in Surah Taqweer, chapter 81, verse number 9, that when the female child is buried alive, and she'll be questioned, for what crime was she killed? A special reference is made that do not kill the female children especially. Because in the olden days, and especially in Arabia, before the Quran was revealed, it was a very common practice that when a daughter was born, very often she was buried alive. Alhamdulillah, after the revelation of the glorious Quran, this evil practice has discontinued in the Arab countries. But yet, unfortunately, it does persist in countries where I come from, like India, and certain countries, many to culture. And according to a survey done by Emily Beckinen on the BBC, on the program Let Her Die, the topic was assignment, she said that every day in India, more than 3,000 fetuses are being aborted after the identified that the females. Quran not only prohibits the killing of children, especially females, it even rebukes the thought of a person becoming sad at the news of the birth of female child. The glorious Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 58, the glorious Quran says that when news is brought to one of them of the birth of a female child, his face darkens and he's filled with inward grief. And he hides his face in shame from the people and thinks that should he let her live in contempt or should he bury her alive? Ah, what an evil choice. Quran rebukes the thought of a person becoming sad at the news of a female child. And our beloved prophet said, in Sahih Muslim, poem number four, hadith number 6364, that the prophet said, that anyone who upbrings two daughters correctly, with kindness and love, till they mature, they will be as close to this, these two fingers, on the day of judgment. And another hadith says that anyone who brings two daughters with love and compassion, till they become mature, they shall enter heaven. Once, there was a person who kissed his son and placed him on his lap in front of the prophet. Prophet objected and said that he should have even kissed his daughter and placed her on the other lap. The first guide was given in the glorious Quran to the whole of humankind is in Surah Ikra or Surah Alak, chapter 96, verse from one to five, he says, Ikra bismi rabbik allazi khalaq, khalaq al insana min alaq, ikra wa rabbuk al akram, allazi allam bil kalam, allam al insana ma allam yalam. Read, recite, or proclaim in the name of thy Lord who created who created the human beings from something which clings, a leech-like substance. Read, thy Lord is most bountiful, who taught men the use of the pen, who taught men that we did not know. The first guidance given to the humankind in the glorious Quran is to read. And the Prophet said that it is obligatory for every Muslim, man or woman, to acquire knowledge. And the Prophet told the parents that it is obligatory that they should educate the children, especially the daughters. Let's discuss family values related with the spouses, that is the husband and wife. The glorious Quran refers to the woman as a muhasana, that's a fortress against the devil, 
unlike other religions, many of which, who consider the woman as an instrument of the devil. And a good woman, she keeps the husband on the straight path, on the Sarat al-Mustaqeem, and prevents him from going on the wrong track. Our beloved, our beloved Prophet said, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in Sahih Bukhari, volume number seven, in the book of Nikah, chapter number three, hadith number four, that, oh, young people, whoever has the means to get married should get married, for it will help you to lower your gaze and guard your modesty. In Islam, we are encouraged early marriage. If you have the means, you should get married earlier. And the glorious Quran says that if you don't have the means, keep yourself modest till Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the means. And our Prophet said, it's a hadith narrated by Anas, may Allah be pleased with him, that anyone who marries completes half his deen, half his religion. So one winning question after time somebody asked me, that does it mean that if I marry twice, I complete my full deen, my full religion? What did the Prophet mean that marriage completes half your deen? What the Prophet meant was, marriage prevents you from promiscuity, from fornication, from homosexuality, which are half the evil in the society. Only if you marry, do you have an opportunity to be a husband or a wife. Only if you marry, do you have an opportunity to be a father or a mother, which are very important duties in Islam. So irrespective of whether you marry once or twice, yet you only complete half your deen. The glorious Quran says in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse 21, that amongst his signs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for you mates of like nature, so that you may dwell in tranquility with them, and he has put love and mercy between your hearts. The glorious Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 21, refers to marriage as a misaq, a sacred covenant. And for a marriage to solemnize, the permission of both would be husband and wife is equally important. That's the boy and the girl. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 19, that do not inherit the woman against the wishes. According to the beloved Prophet, the Hadith in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 7, in the book of Niqah, chapter number 43, Hadith number 5138, that once a lady by the name of Khansa bin Khadim al Ansariya, she approached the Prophet and said that she has been forced by her father to marry a man who she did not like, and the Prophet nullified the marriage. Permission of both boy and girl is equally important for a marriage to solemnize in Islam. And in Islam, we prefer calling the woman folk by the correct terminology, not by the English word housewife. You know, because she's not married to the house to be referred to as housewife. You know, housewife means wife of the house. We prefer calling the women folk as homemakers because they make the home, they build the home. And she's married to an equal. In Islam, men and women are equal. Equality does not mean identicality. And the glorious Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 228, that the women have rights as against them on terms equitable, but the men have a degree of advantage. Many of the men, including many Muslims, they misunderstand the meaning of this verse and they think that men are superior. Some of them think that the Quran says men are superior. And the quote a verse of the glorious Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 34, it says, Ar-Rijalu Kawwaman Ala Nisa, that the men are the Kawam of the women. Kawam comes from the root word Akama, which means to stand up for. What it actually means that the men have one degree of extra responsibility in supporting the women. They don't have one degree extra superiority in bossing over the women. They have one degree additional responsibility in supporting the women. Because the verse continues that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given one more strength than the other. And the glorious Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number 19, that treat your wives on footing of equity and kindness. And I started my talk by quoting a verse from the glorious Quran from Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, Verse number 187, we say, libasul lakum, libasul That they are your garments, and you are their garments. The roles of husband and wife in a family are that, like garments. You know, garments are used to conceal. Husband and wife should conceal each other's faults. They are used for protecting. They should protect each other. They are used for beautification. 
husband and wife should beautify one another. It's a role of a hand and glove. And in Islam, the men are supposed to be the bread earner in Islam, in the family life in Islam. A woman, she need not earn her living. Before she's married, it's the duty of the father and the brother. And after she's married, it's the duty of the husband and the son to look after her boarding, clothing, lodging, and all financial aspects. She need not work for a living. She is financially more secure as compared to the man in Islam. But if she wishes to work, if there are financial problems, she may work as long as the atmosphere is Islamic and Islamic work and within the purview of the Islamic Sharia. Even during marriage, she is on the receiving end. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 4, that gift to the woman, a marital gift in Dawa. That means for a marriage to sermonize, a maher has to be given. The husband gives to the would-be wife a marital gift. It's compulsory. But in the country where I come from, that's India, the society is the opposite. The dowry is given by the woman to the husband, would-be husband. And it's a cultural practice which has poisoned the whole society. You know, if a woman has to marry a graduate, she has to give 100,000 rupees. If it's an engineer, she has to give 500,000 rupees. If it's a doctor, one million rupees, as they are selling, you know, herds and cattle in the marketplace. In Islam, it's prohibited to demand any dowry from the wife. Willingly, if the parents of the wife give certain gifts, they're most welcome. But demanding directly or indirectly is prohibited. You cannot say that my son, he likes to travel in a Mercedes car, indicating that you require a Mercedes car in dowry. My son likes to live in a four-bedroom flat, indicating that in marriage, I will marry my son to your daughter only if you give a four-bedroom apartment. Demanding directly or indirectly dowry from the would-be wife is not allowed in Islam. And if, suppose, the woman becomes a widow, unfortunately, she even gets her share. And a woman even inherits. She even gets maintenance in the period of idda financial support. And even if divorce takes place, she gets financial support. And there is a great misconception amongst the people regarding why does Islam allow a man to have more than one wife? Time doesn't permit us to go into the details of why it allows. But just in brief, I'd like to say that in fact, all the religions, if you read the scriptures, they did give permission for the men to marry as many wives as they wanted. No religious scripture that I know of tells a man to marry one except the glorious Quran. In fact, if you read the Hindu scriptures, they give permission to as many as you want. It's later on that the Hindu priests or the Indian law restricted the marriage for a Hindu man to only one wife. Even the Old Testament, even the Bible, if you read, if you read the first Kings, chapter number 11, verse number 3, Solomon had 700 wives. Abraham had three wives. It's later on that the rabbi and the church put a restriction. Islam says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 3, that marry women of a choice in twos, threes, or fours, but if you can't do justice, marry only one. And the reason if people want, they can ask me the question at the time. But it is for the modesty of the woman that a man is allowed to marry more than one wife. It's not a fard. It's not compulsory that a man should marry. Some people think it's fard. Neither is it that you'll get more blessings if you marry more than one wife. It's optional. It's optional. But if you marry, the criteria is you should do justice. If you don't do justice, you are in trouble. That divorce should never be given under normal circumstances. It is as a last resort if the husband and wife cannot get along as a last resort. Under normal circumstances, you should avoid it to the best ability you can as a last resort. And in some societies, you can give divorce in some societies, you can't. Some religions give permission, while the others don't. Some have certain restrictions. The Bible says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 31 32, that it has been said of the old times that whosoever putteth a woman away, putteth a wife away, you should give a bill of divorce. That was the law of Moses, peace be upon him. That if you want to give a divorce, give a bill of divorce. But Jesus, peace be upon him, said, But I say unto you, that whosoever putteth away his wife, 
except for fornication, he asks her to commit adultery. That means only in case of fornication can you give divorce according to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 31 and 32. And there's a lot of misconception regarding divorce in Islam. Basically, you can classify under five headings. That one is mutually given both the husband and wife. Second is unilaterally by the husband, by the will of the husband, he wishes. Third is unilaterally by the will of the wife. If it is mentioned in the marital contract, it's known as isma or talaqat afid. That if she writes in the marital contract, that even she, if she wishes, she can give a divorce. And if the husband agrees during the marital contract, then even she can give unilateral divorce. The fourth is that if it's not mentioned in the marital contract, that the wife can give unilateral divorce. But if the husband ill-treats her or doesn't give her due rights, she can very well go to the Qazi, to the chief judge, and take a nikai fask, nullification of the marriage. And the last is that even the husband is good, but if the wife wants to part away, she can request the husband to give divorce, it's known as kula. Basically, or broadly, there are five types. First, by mutual consent of both, husband and wife. Second, by unilateral will of the husband. Third, by unilateral will of the wife, if it's mentioned in the marital contract. Fourth is if the husband ill-treats, she can do nikai fask. And fifth, that even if the husband is good, and if for personal reason she wants to part, she can take kula. Let's analyze the family values of the parents, concerning parents in Islam. That's father and mother. Next to worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 23 and 24, that I have ordained for you that you worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that you respect your parents. And if anyone or both of them reach old age, do not say a word of contempt. Don't even say off to them. But lower to them your wing of humility and address them with honor and pray to the Lord that bless them as they cherished me in childhood. Means even if your parents get old, you cannot say a word of contempt. You can't even do off to them. The Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse 151, that be good to your parents. The Quran says in Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse number 14, that we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. In travail upon travail did your mother bore you, and in years twain was your weaning. The Quran says in Surah Akaf, chapter 46, verse number 15, we have enjoined on the human beings to be good to the parents. In pain did the mother bore you, and pain did she give you birth. Our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Ibn Majah as well as the Hadith of Ahmad, that paradise lies beneath the feet of your mother. That doesn't mean that if my mother is walking on muck and filth, that thing becomes paradise. What it means, that if you love your mother, if you respect your mother, if you're good to your mother, you will, inshallah, God willing, go to paradise. And a prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number eight, in the book of Adab, book of manners, chapter number two, hadith number two, that a man came to the Prophet and asked him that who deserves the maximum love and companionship in this world? And the Prophet said, your mother. The man asked, who's next? The Prophet said, your mother. The man asked the third time, who's next? And the Prophet said, your mother. The man asked after that who? Then the Prophet said, your father. That means when it comes to love and companionship to the parents, according to the Hadith of a beloved Prophet, 75% goes to the mother, 25% goes to the father, three-fourth goes to the mother, and one-fourth goes to the father. In short, the mother gets the gold medal, she gets the silver medal, as well as the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with the mere consolation prize. In Islam, after a person dies, the inheritance is given in the family according to the laws laid down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is mentioned in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number 11 and 12, that as to the inheritance of children, the males, they get double the share of the female. That means the son gets double the share of the daughter. If only one daughter, she gets half. If two or more, they share in a two-third. As to the parents, each get one-sixth. If 
No children when the mother gets one third after paying off the debts. Verse number 12 of Swarnisa says, as in what your wife leave for you, you get a half if there are no children. You get a quarter if there are children. As for what you leave for your wives, your wives get one fourth if there are no children and one eighth if there are children. And there are people who take objection that, you know, why do the women always inherit half the share of the men in the family? That's not always true, as I mentioned, where it comes to parents, both get equal if there are children. And if there are no children, and if suppose there is a lady who dies and she has no children, then the husband gets half, the father gets one sixth, and the mother gets one third. That means the mother inherits double that of the father. The mother inherits double than that of the father. So there are cases in which women do get double also, but I do agree in most of the cases they get half. And the reason is that since the financial burden is laid on the shoulder of the man in Islam, Almighty God does not want to put an extra burden on the male. For example, if after giving the shares of a person who has died, a person dies, and after giving the shares to all the relatives, Suppose 150,000 pounds are remaining for the children, and he has one son and one daughter. The son will get 100,000 pounds, and the daughter will get 50,000 pounds. But would you prefer inheriting 100,000 pounds and spending maybe 80 or 90,000 pounds on your family and on your relatives, or would you prefer inheriting 50,000 pounds and keeping all for yourself? You need not even spend a single pound on your clothing. That's the duty of the man in the family. So, but naturally, even in inheritance, the woman actually, overall, is on a much better level. I would like to end my talk by giving the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number 135. That, Ya Yo Amunu, O you believe, stand out firmly for justice. Stand out firmly for justice as witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it be against yourself, against your parents against your relatives, against your kith and kin, or rich and poor, for Allah protects all. Where it comes to giving witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's on the highest level. Even if it has to go against yourself, you should go. Even against your parents, against your relatives, because worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the highest in Islam. Wa dawan, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Naik. I've, as I said, I've not heard him before, but I certainly look out for his tapes and uh, look into his talks a bit further. Thank you very much indeed. Just a few logistical points. Um, the question and answer session, um, we've actually scheduled to start at 10 o'clock, but the way things are going, we may actually be able to start a bit earlier than that in which case we'll finish a bit earlier. There will be no uh, questions from the floor. Questions have to be written. So anybody, if you want to, the paper on all the seats, if you want to submit some questions, there are some brothers from the young Muslims who will be wandering up and down the sides of the hall. If you could just pass them to them, and we'll select the questions that uh, we'll try and answer later on. Now I'd like to ask uh, William Taylor to come and give his comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Zakir. Uh, for me, it was fascinating to hear this uh, joint analysis of the task which faces us uh, in our society. I'm speaking now about Britain, uh, but as Christians and Muslims together. Um, I simply uh, draw out of uh, Dr. Zakir's address uh, two things he identified as a major problem within our own society. Firstly, divorce. As you may know, Britain has the highest rate of divorce in Europe and the disintegration of the family. Uh, this is a task which faces both our religions and which we can address together, and I hope there will be a forum for this. I've just come back from Egypt, and I've been in one of the Egyptian Coptic monasteries, and a phrase which was used by Antony of Egypt, who founded the Egyptian monastic uh, way of life, has come to haunt me, and it's this one. He said, your life and your death are with your neighbor. And this is speaking about the cohesive role of religious faith in defining uh, a relig uh, society's values. 
And I'd like to draw on several of the points about godlessness, because this is the situation which faces us all in liberal Western societies. And it is that absence of the ultimate and transcendent authority of which he spoke, which uh, is the common problem uh, facing us and all the human behavioral problems which stem out of that. And submission um, with, uh, with the fruits he, uh, he drew are common to all of us. And I do hope that the common analysis of the, as it were, societal failure which faces us will be a cause for cooperation between our two faiths in the future. And especially that uh, analysis of the pre-Islamic society in Arabia, um, with its senseless violence and lack of meaning and so on, as startling parallels uh, with our own times. So thank you very much for both those analyses. Thank you. Fine, thank you very much. Just a reminder, if you want to ask any questions, please write them down and pass them along to any of the brothers walking along the sides, and then we'll try and answer as many of those as possible. Can I ask uh, Reverend Taylor actually to start, because he actually needs to get away. So perhaps if we can get him uh, to come, he's got the questions in front of him, so try and answer as many as he can in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. It's just that he needs to get away. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, whoever sent me the uh, three questions on homosexuality. Uh, I'd like to approach this subject by speaking about the uh, biblical view and the view in Christian tradition of sexual activity, because sexual activity in the view of the Bible and the Christian tradition is reserved for the married state. That's the first thing to make very clear, that sexual activity is to be confined within marriage. Any sexual activity outside marriage is uh, described as sin in the Bible and in Christian tradition. So I would put uh, homosexuality, the Christian tradition puts homosexuality uh, firmly in that context as sexual activity outside marriage and is described in the uh, biblical and Christian tradition as a sin. Next uh, question is, does the Bible prophesy the advent of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Um, the answer is, that's a very difficult question to answer, and it's not clear. Um, my own um, perspective from the biblical evidence itself is that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not prophesied within the text of Scripture. Um, but I know that Muslims would take a different view. Uh, and similarly, uh, a similar question is, where do you place the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Um, I, I, like other Christians, uh, revere and respect the uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the Muslim tradition as the Ahl al-Kitab, the people of the book, uh, Jews, Christians, and Muslims share our common Abrahamic faith and, uh, and that's where I, I, I would place that. And certainly within my own experience of working in the Diocese of Jerusalem, Palestinian diocese, have had the closest cooperation with uh, Muslims and Christians in that city, in particular resisting Israeli occupation. Uh, but that's, that's uh, getting me into another area. Um, I'd like to move on now to uh, other questions. What is the status and position of Jesus in Islam and in Christianity? Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes an article of faith to believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. The Muslims and Christians, we are going together. But there are parting of faiths. There are many of our Christian brothers and sisters who say that Jesus, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity. He claimed that he was God. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is no unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus, peace be upon him, himself says that I'm God or where he says, worship me. 
there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus, peace be upon him, himself says he's God or where he says, worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, Jesus, peace be upon him, himself says, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, my father is greater than I. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devils with the Spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I with the finger of God cast out devils. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Not my will, but the will of Almighty God. If you translate into Arabic, it's Islam. And anyone who says, not my will, but God's will, he's a Muslim. As the Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 52, that Isa a.s. was a Muslim. He never said he was God. In fact, he said he was sent by God. He said in Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 24, the words you hear are not mine, but my father's who has sent me. Gospel of John, chapter number 17, verse number 3, this is life eternal so that you may believe in one true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Mention the Gospel of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22, that Euro Israel, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles which God did by him and you were witness to it. He never claimed divinity, the Bible says, a man approved of God by wonders and miracles which God did by him. And when you are asked the question, which is the first of the commandment, Jesus, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse 29 in Hebrew, Shama Israelo, Abnai al Haino Abnai Khad, that Yoro Israel, the God, our Lord, is one God. <laughs>
The woman shall not wear clothes that which pertinent to a man, and a man shall not wear clothes that which pertinent to a woman. It's mentioned in the first Timothy, chapter number two, verse number nine, that the woman should be dressed up with modesty, with shamefacedness and sobriety. They should not wear costly array and braided hair of gold, and they should not wear expensive array. So if you compare the dress code in the Bible and the Quran, the same. How was Mother Mary, may Allah be pleased with, how was she dressed up? If you have seen a photograph, just like how Muslim women should be dressed up. So if you read the scriptures, not going on what the followers do, if you read the scripture, the dress code of Islam and Christianity is the same. Is not Islam ruthless as it has permitted chopping of hands for theft, whereas Christianity is a religion of love and mercy? And there is a reference to the Quran of this. What the brother is referring to, that there's a quotation in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 30, which says that as to the thief, be it a man or a woman, chop of his or her hand as a punishment for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Islam, there is a philosophy that you should not rob. Same as then Christianity. But Islam, besides telling not to rob, it shows you a way how to achieve that state in which people will not rob. Islam has a system of zakat, that's every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, he or she should give 2.5% of that saving every lunar year in charity. And it's the duty of the state to look after the people that they are properly fed, etc. And if after that anyone robs, the Islamic Sharia says, Quran, sorry, Maida, chapter 5, verse number 38, that as to the thief beat a man or a woman, chop of his or her hand as a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People may say, it's a ruthless law, it's a merciless law. I'm asking the question that today America, which happens to be one of the most advanced countries in the world, unfortunately also has one of the highest rates of crime. If you implement the Islamic Sharia in America, that every man, he should, give zakat, who's rich, 2.5% of a Texas saving charity, and the state should look after the people, and after that if anyone robs, chop off his or her hand as a punishment. I'm asking the question, will the rate of robbery, will it increase, will it remain the same, or will it decrease in America? What will happen? It will decrease. It's a practical law. You implement the Sharia. Regarding Christianity is a merciful religion. Yes, it speaks about God as merciful. Even Quran, every chapter begins with the statement, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. There is even a reference in the Bible regarding chopping off the hand for people who don't know. If you read the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 25, verse number 11 and 12, it says that if two men are striving against each other, fighting against each other, and if the wife of one of the husbands who is being defeated by the man, if she helps the husband in overpowering the man who's fighting him and holds him by the secrets, that's the private part, the Bible says in verse number 12, chop off her hand, and the eyes shall show no mercy. So even the Bible has chopping off the hand. If the wife helps the husband, if someone is trying to overpower him. The Bible says chopping off the hands. Deuteronomy, chapter 25, verse number 11 and 12. And Islam is a merciful religion as well as just. It sees to it that it does justice between both. The person committing the crime, if the punishment is strict, he will not commit again. And the person on whom crime is committed, Allah sees to it that mercy is done on both. Afterwards? Inshallah, after that, I'll answer the other question. Reverend Taylor actually has to go and pick up his uh, mother from the station, so I'm going to actually ask him to come and um, answer. He's got loads of questions. He won't have time to answer them, perhaps more than two or three. Uh, and then I'd like to thank him very much for coming and helping us at this meeting. Thank you, dear Reverend. Uh, well, I think um, I'm looking, doing my duty as a son, I have to collect my mother from Euston Station, which should take me straight to paradise as I'm looking after my mother. <laughs> Family values. I thank you to all of you who've sent uh, questions to me. They're all very important questions. I wish I had the time to answer them all, um, but I'm going to focus on three of them uh, because they um, deal with different areas. First one is a factual one, which I'd like to address straight away, and it's this. Uh, why is it that the Bible is now recorded in the Greek text when Jesus' original language was Aramaic? Please explain. The reason for this is that the New Testament documents were written in Greek, but also in Aramaic and Syriac 
which is the, the Christian dialect of Aramaic, as it were, uh, to reach a maximum audience. Uh, Aramaic was more restricted to the Near East, and if you wanted to communicate with the wider Roman Empire throughout the Mediterranean, then Greek would be the language you would use to, uh, to do that. But of course, there are phrases in the Gospels preserved in Aramaic, Talitha Kumi, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, and phrases like this, which were used by Jesus and preserved in the Gospels. Um, the next one is a, an important one politically uh, because it speaks about Kosovo. Um, the question is this, what the Christian world and civilized West is doing today to stop another genocide in Kosovo similar to that of Bosnia? Well, I would I want, want to draw a parallel here with Iraq and to immediately um, squash the suggestion, as it were, that this is the Christian world. I would talk about the West, but I would not make that synonymous with the Christian world. Uh, the West has its own reasons for uh, its own realpolitik uh, in the world, and it's, I would say that it's nothing to do with the Christian faith. Uh, for example, the people of Iraq, both Muslim and Christian, are continuing to suffer under the United Nations sanctions, which are kept there, I believe, by the will of the West. That's nothing to do with uh, Christian faith, because there you have the example of both uh, Christian and Muslim Iraqis suffering under the same regime. So I'd like to uh, dispel this myth that the West is Christian. Uh, first of all, and in Kosovo, the, that's a basic question which is addressed by the Christian faith in its appeal to basic human rights for believers, whether they're Albanians in Kosovo or Bosnians and so on. And I agree that the, um, the West and the United Nations in general needs to take a much stronger line in protecting the um, ethnic Albanians within Kosovo in giving them their human rights and dignity within Serbia or within whatever federation they move into. And finally, a nice question from someone which says this, after today's conference, do you have any doubts about being a Christian and have you seen that Islam is the only religion? <laughs> Thank you very much for this. I was uh, and always am impressed with the level of knowledge of faith of the, uh, within the Muslim community. Um, and as always, my contact with Islam continues to make me admire uh, it, that faith, Islam, and its adherence. And yes, I see constantly the attractiveness of Islam and hope that you can see the attractiveness of Christianity also. So thank you very much for that. And I'm sorry I have to leave. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, just to let you know what's happening for the rest of the evening, I'm going to ask Dr. Naik to speak for 10 minutes. He can answer one question or 10 questions in that time, but that's all he's got, 10 minutes. Nine questions in 10 minutes is difficult. I'll try my level best, inshallah. Is it okay for a husband to demand respect from his wife in Islam? Yes. But the Quran says, as I said in my talk in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 187, Hunna libasul lakum, wantum libasul lahunna. That they are your garments and you are your garments. Wives are the garments of husbands, and husbands are the garments of the wives. In the same way, even the husband should respect the feeling and emotions of the wife. It's both. Both should respect each other. Can a brother marry more than one wife, even if he cannot afford to maintain one, in a reasonable standard. <laughs> the reasonable standard of each individual differs. One individual may say reasonable standard means I want at least five bedroom apartment, I want a Mercedes car. The reasonable standard differs. What the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 3, that marry women of a choice in two, threes and fours. But if you can't do justice, marry one. The criteria is doing justice. If you have one Mercedes car, and if you feel the requirement is marry one more, sell the Mercedes car, and buy two Toyota cars and give each wife one. Sell the five bedroom apartment and get two bedroom apartments and give each wife one or keep both the wives in five bedroom apartment. The criteria is equal justice. Reasonable standard differs. That doesn't mean, if you mean reasonable standard means a particular, he should have a certain amount. That means poor people cannot marry more than one wife. That's not the criteria. 
I'm sure the Muslims will agree that only deen acceptable to Allah is Islam and that it is incorrect to say that no religion is bad. I do agree. The Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 19, in the deen in the law is Islam. The only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Islam. And I do agree totally, if anyone says no religion is bad and stops there, I don't agree with him. As a Muslim, I don't agree with him. Because Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 64, Come to come in terms as between us and you. What I would say, that all religions teach good things. Because every religion teaches good and bad things, except Islam. Teaches only good. So instead of saying, no religion is bad, if you want to come to common terms, I would say, all religions teach good things. First talk about the good points between both the religions, and then come to the bad points. What you can say, no religion teaches everything bad. That you can say. But you can't only say no religion is bad and stop that, trying to butter the other person, because Quran clearly states in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse 85, that no religion will be acceptable on the side of Allah, except Islam. If anyone demands any other religion besides Islam, it will never be accepted on him on the day of judgment. Is it true that Jesus will come back and do Christians believe this? Yes, we do agree the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 158 that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised him up alive. So we agree he was raised up alive. And the reason that he was raised up alive is why? Because Jesus, peace be upon him, is the only messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whose followers mistook him that he claimed divinity. They misunderstood him, that he claimed divinity, that he said he was God. So he has been raised up not to teach anything new. The Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 3, on this day have I perfected my religion for you and chosen for you Islam and completed your deen for you. Islam is complete. Nothing new can be added, nothing can be subtracted. Isa alayhi salam will not come to teach anything new. He will come to tell the Christians that I never said that I was God. As the Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 116, he will tell to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you be my witness. I never told them to worship me, but I said, Abdullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbukum, who is my Lord and your Lord. Similar message given in the Bible. On that day when people will come and tell to Jesus, peace be upon him, Oh my Lord, oh my Lord, did we not do wonders and miracles? Jesus will say, ye men of iniquity, you depart from here. I don't even know you. Who will he tell? To the Muslims? To the Hindus, he'll tell to the Christians that these sinful people, I don't even know, you depart from here. He will come again to correct the Christian, not to bring any new teachings. Please explain the advent mention of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Bible. Does the Bible prophesy the advent of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? There's two questions, same. There are several prophecies of beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Bible. Old Testament as well as New Testament. It's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18, that God says, I shall raise thee up a prophet from among thy brethren, like unto thee, and I shall put my words into his mouth, and he shall say all that I command him. Christians say that this prophecy refers to Jesus, peace be upon him. But if you analyze that Jesus was unlike Moses, peace be upon him. What they say, that see, because Jesus was a Jew and you are the prophet, he was like Moses, peace be upon him. If these two are the only criteria to fulfill the prophecy, then all the prophets mentioned in the Bible after Moses, peace be upon him, Solomon, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Daniel, Hosea, John, all of them fulfilled the prophecy because they were Jew and they were prophets of God. If you analyze this prophecy, it fits no one but a beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because both Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon him, they had a natural birth unlike Jesus, peace be upon him. Muhammad and Moses, peace be upon them, both, they were married their children. Jesus, peace be upon him, did not have. Both of them, they died a natural death. Jesus, peace be upon him, he didn't die a natural death. According to the Quran, he was healed up alive, in according to the Bible. But the false reading of Christian, they say that he was put on the cross. And there are more similarities between Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Musa alayhi salam than Isa alayhi salam and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Further, it says, from among their brethren. And we know that the Arabs are brethren of the Jews. Again, if you read the book of Isaiah, chapter number 12, verse number 29, it says that a prophet shall come who's not learned. And it will be said to him, pray, read this, and he will say, I'm not learned. When the first revelation came to our beloved prophet Ikra, Surah Ikra, chapter 96, verse number 1, when Archangel Gabriel said, Ikra, our prophet said, Ma'ana biqari, I'm not learned. Exactly befitting the prophecy. Even the name of the prophet is mentioned in the Old Testament in the Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16. In Hebrew it is said, Hikumamitakim, we kulli Muhammadim. Zaydudi wa Zairai bayna Jerusalem. Muhammadim, im is added for respect in the Semitic languages, in the Hebrew language. Muhammad, im, Muhammadim. Im is respect, it's actually Muhammad with respect, im, it's called Muhammadin. But the translate as, his mouth is more sweet, he's altogether lovely. He's my beloved, he's my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. But the original manuscript contained the word of Muhammad in the Old Testament. 
In the New Testament, if you refer to the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 16, Gospel of John, chapter number 15, verse number 26, it says about the coming of the beloved prophet as a comforter. It says in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 7, that, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter shall not come. For if I depart, shall I send him. The Christians say that this comforter is the Holy Spirit. But the criteria here is that the comforter shall come only if Jesus Christ, peace be upon, departs. I knew that the Holy Spirit was already there in Elizabeth. It was there when Jesus Christ, peace be upon, was born, when he was being baptized. So this prophecy cannot refer to the Holy Spirit. It refers to our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Further, if you read in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14, it says, I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. For he, when the Spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you to all truths. All the prophets prophesy the coming of another prophet and the last and final messenger prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, except the last and final messenger. And I have given a talk on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the various world religious scriptures, in Hindu scriptures, Buddhist scriptures, and Parsi scriptures, Jewish scriptures, Christian scriptures. You can refer to the cassette for details. <laughs> Is temporary marriage allowed in Islam? Please, I know Muslims who believe in it, explain. Okay, the time is up. If you're referring to muta, it's not allowed at all. Agreed, previously a prophet didn't say it was wrong, didn't say it was yes, because some prohibitions came in stages, like the alcohol came in stages. Similarly, the prophet didn't say anything. But in the seventh Hijri, during the Tabuk expedition, the prophet clearly stated that muta is haram. The other question is time permits, inshallah. Thank you very much uh, to all the speakers and to everyone attending. Can I just ask for a little bit of help? As you go out, can you just stack some chairs as you go out, just uh, two or three at a time, and uh, it'll make the whole job a lot easier for us. Uh, just uh, thanks very much indeed. Is there a father in this world who would not try to provide for his children and his wife? Is there a father in this world who would want to be loved? Sell away from his family. Is there a father?